Well, welcome to Talk to Thinkers, Anne. Well, thank you for uh, asking me. I think your series of podcasts are very good. Great. Um, well, let's uh, kick off uh, where I like to kick off these interviews with the start of people's lives. Um, can you say something about your childhood, your early years? Okay. Really? Um, well, my, my childhood involved a lot of traveling around. My, my parents are both from, uh, from Birmingham in the Midlands. Um, and they met, they met after the war. My father was a pilot and was shot down very early in the war, which was probably fortunate for me because the mortality rate was very high. So spent a lot of the uh, war in prisoner of war camp. My mother drove army trucks. And uh, so they met after the war and uh, they moved around a lot. Uh, my father had a job as a customs and excise officer, which is sort of basically dealing with tax duties of businesses and I don't know if they my sister elder sister was born in Arbroath in Scotland I was born in Lancaster in England we spent some time at the big ICI factory in Teesside and then the main thing of my childhood we uh, we moved up to the eastern highlands in Scotland um, in those days uh, uh, all the whiskey distilleries had to have customs and excise officers attached to them. Um, they all had two two excise officers uh, who had to be present when the duty free warehouses with all these great barrels of whiskey were uh, were opened. Uh, so we we went up to the Spey Valley in the Eastern Highlands. I was about four at the time. Um, for those who who know their whiskies, uh, my dad was attached first to the Cardew distillery and then later to the Dow Ewan one. For me, it was a completely idyllic existence. Um, it's completely free in the country. We had a kind of a wood at the back of the house, the river spay at the front of the house. We lived on a, a on a terrace, which was like just attached to the distillery, which was like a microcosm of society. So there was a a detached house for the manager and then two semi-detached houses for the excise officers, terraces for the workers, and then right at the end, uh, some uh, bungalows for the retired workers. So, you know, the kids from the terrace, we we went on a bus five miles to the nearest school in Avalauer. We were we were slightly oddities. We were English, of course. Uh, we were also Catholic. My my parents are um were they were what they called a mixed marriage in those days. My dad was Protestant and my mother Catholic. So the children had to be brought up Catholic. My uh, my partner, uh, Kieran, uh, who uh, comes from Cork, and he was educated by the Christian brothers, and he's always um, uh, teasing me about my very poor grasp of Catholic doctrine because obviously being in Scotland, we never went to Catholic school. Anyway, it was a great it was a great childhood. I think my parents my parents didn't have either of them very joyful childhoods. In my father's case, kind of Victorian repression in the family. In my mother's case, I think mostly poverty. And they were absolutely united in wanting to make sure that we had a kind of great childhood. So I, I have wonderful, uh, wonderful memories of it. That was, uh, there, were, there were three girls and a boy by the time we left Scotland, which was when I was about 10. Okay. So you, you came second in the family, is that yeah, right? Yeah, I was the second. Okay. Um, so, um, and was part of that, uh, your parents, their commitment to making your childhoods better than theirs, was that part of that giving you a good education? Absolutely. They were really committed to, um, I mean, neither of them had had a great, uh, a great chance of education. Uh, you know, the people left school at 14. Uh, at the time that they were growing up, my father got a scholarship for an extra year, but that just took him to 15. Um, I mean, in Scotland, we just went to uh, just the very traditional school that ran from five to, I think, 16. When I've been back since, it's just a primary school. The older kids must travel further to secondary school now, I think. But um, so that was very traditional. In fact, it was quite brutal. You know, I remember the Miss Watts, the terrifying teacher in my final year, had a leather strap and uh, and indeed used it. But then when I moved to 10, moved when we returned at 10 to Birmingham, um, I went to, I uh, passed an exam to a direct grant school. I mean, they don't exist anymore, but these are schools which are fee-paying schools. But the... Uh, 
with a competitive exam to get in, but the, the local council pays a, a, a grant to the school, which means that they will offer a certain proportion of the people who pass the exam a free place. I don't know what the proportion was, you know, that we never, the girls never talked about whether they were fee paying or free paying, <laughs> uh, but it was uh, probably about 20, 30%. Anyway, so, I mean, it's, a, it's an indication of how seriously they took our education because they had to arrange for me to take the exam while I was still in Scotland. So I took it in, um, my father arranged for the vicar to uh, um, invigilate the exam in his study. Anyway, so I, so I went to, I went to, uh, I got a very good education. <laughs> um, you know, it was a kind of context unusually in those days when the teachers would kind of take it for granted that we would all be trying to get to university. All the girls would be assumed that they would go to university. Personally, I grumbled a lot about it. I saw it as a very elite, uh, very privileged school. Um, much, much, I felt, I assumed I was probably wrong, but I thought that you know, all of the girls were much more thoroughly middle class than my family. Uh, certainly it was true when we had discussions of politics that most of the parents would vote conservative, whereas mine would vote Labour. So my parents absolutely did the best for us. But of course, I was ungrateful and thought that uh, uh, they'd sent me to this elite school that I was, you know. I subsequently realised that I owe a lot to them for <laughs> for pushing with the education. Yeah. they and And the other thing about them is that they... They never for a moment suggested that the education of the three girls was less important than the education of their son. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, quite I, remarkable, yeah. that, that, sorry, you no, know, quite remarkable that people of that generation they were able to see through the yes, uh, yeah, without, without an education themselves, they could yeah. see the injustices intuitively, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, great. So, I mean, you suggest there, I just wanted to get a sense of what you were like as a person before we uh, talked about your university years. Yes. Um, you indicate there you, you had some sort of keen social sense, even in, in school, and maybe suggesting you were a bit of a rebel. Um, what I would love, I would, yeah, I would love to think I was a bit of a rebel. In fact, I think I was a kind of, uh, you know, rather quiet, slightly introverted. I was, an, I was an obsessive reader. I mean, I just read all the time, but fiction, I mean, you know, 18th, 19th, 20th century fiction, anything I could get my hands on. You know, I'd, you know, read in, in bed with a lamp under the bedclothes after I'd been told to go to sleep. I'd read walking home from the bus stop on the way back from school. I had quite a few incidents with lampposts <laughs> in the process. Um, uh, but also, uh, well, my elder sister Frances and I, she was just a couple of years uh, between us, we used to go out to discos, uh, night clubbing, um, where, of course, I would never admit to anyone that I was bookish or that I went to King Edwards. In those days, one didn't, girls didn't admit to being clever. Um, so in a way, uh, living two slightly different kinds of lives. So I wouldn't say it was rebellious, <laughs> but I, I remember one occasion when um, our uh, English literature teacher, Miss Flint, um, was rhapsodizing about uh, writing your essays through the night to meet your deadline and finishing the work just as the sun is coming up in the dawn and asking everyone in the class, um, you know, who else had, had ever seen the dawn? And I started telling this story about seeing the dawn with my sister as we came out of this darkened nightclub and then realizing, no, no, this wasn't at all what Miss Flint wanted to hear. But yeah, I would have loved to have been more of a rebel. I mean, you're right. I, I did have a strong sense of class inequality. And certainly in the later years of my school years, I was beginning to read around um, uh, socialism in a rather kind of mild and modest way but i i would have liked to have been more of a rebel then than i actually was mm -hmm. okay so we're talking here uh the 60s are we yes 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 so it's through the 60s i was in my secondary education okay and um were you also registering what when you were in school what was going on the bigger the wider culture i mean i assume the beatles the, Oh yeah, yeah. Pop music was... uh, yeah, I got to see the Beatles. Yeah. Okay. So that was that kind of um, was that having an impact on you, or was it mainly books? 
Oh, yeah. No, I was very into uh, contemporary music, but living in Birmingham, particularly I was into Tamla Motown, which was the big thing in uh, in Birmingham in those days. But yes, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. Um, I, it all, I uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was, I suppose it was part of this kind of slightly double life that I lived that some of the more sophisticated girls at school would be dating boys from the university and listening to Bob Dylan. And I was listening to Tamla Motown and going to discos. So, um, but it was that period in which, you know, all that was available to people. I still think the kind of the best music ever was the 60s and the 70s. And I'm sorry for the younger generation, really. Mm. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 I pick up on with you Radiohead. I think there's still good bands out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But um, yeah, it, there's no doubt it was a it was a golden age for yeah. music. Um, so okay, so you were the first uh, in your family, really, first generation to go to university. Yes, yeah. And you decide to go to University of Bristol, where you do politics awesome. and philosophy, I think. Um, so what drew you there, and what drew you to those subjects? So Bristol, well, first my uh, my kind of sense that I would I'd been sent against my wishes to an elite privileged secondary school there was no way I was going to apply to go to Oxford or Cambridge uh who knows whether I'd have got in anyway but you know so so I decided to go to Bristol and, and kind of partly because it was a big city where I thought I'd go nightclubbing I mean you know of course when you go to university all you all you do is socialize in the university but um but also the oddity of that I mean Bristol is, in fact, known or was known then as the place where people who failed to get into Oxford and Cambridge would choose to go to Bristol. So my idea that I was making a stand against elite privilege was a bit weird. But anyway, I I went to Bristol, which which in fact is a is was in those days a great place to be a, a, a university student. I chose philosophy and politics. Um, well, I, I was already interested in politics, though, as I say, in a kind of, you know, relatively, um, you know, not very yet very deep manner. Philosophy, I mean, apart from not wanting to do the same subjects as I studied at A-level, I didn't really have much of an idea about what philosophy was about. I, I remember preparing myself for the interview by dipping into Plato's Republic. Um, which, you know, when you think about it, you know, you're 17, you open Plato's Republic, nobody's really told you how to think about it. It's, it's kind of, you know, what on earth is going on? And anyway, at Bristol, I don't think they had any specialists in ancient Greek philosophy. So it was a bit beside the point as a, as a preparation for that particular interview. So I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, but, you know, it, it worked out as a, as a good choice for me. Mm. Um, I mean, when you got there, did it live up to expectations intellectually? Well, the um, so I, I was doing a joint degree, which was like studying in two separate departments. Um, the politics department at the time, um, I mean, it's, it's very different now, but it was a bit dull at the time. Politics was taught in a very, very much learning about the institutions of government. Um, it kind of always struck me as rather symbolic. <laughs> Looking back, the the head of department at the time was an expert in the committee system of the House of Lords, which kind of doesn't kind of grab you as the most exciting part of politics. Uh, the philosophy um, was much more interesting. The head of department at the time was a uh, a Kantian, and we were we were taught philosophy as a kind of uh, a kind of quasi Hegelian triad, you know. So you had the kind of the the rationalists represented by Descartes failed to work out how we know what we know. The empiricists had a go, Locke, Barclay and Hume uh, still messed it up. And then Kant comes in, um, makes sense of it all with his argument about thought requiring certain preconditions which we can't in, in themselves prove, but which enable us to, uh, you know, uh, enable, make the world intelligible to us. So political philosophy wasn't especially live in either politics or um, the philosophy side of, of my life at the time. So, um, so yeah, and, and particularly by my third year, um, you know, which is when I'd kind of formed a, a group of uh, a group of friends who were kind of, you know, you know, where we 
I just remember the final year of a lot of studying in the library, meeting up afterwards to discuss what we'd been studying. It became very exciting by the time of my third year. Um, it took a while for me to really get kind of gripped by the by the subjects. But yes, in the end, it was uh, it was pretty stimulating. OK, um, so I mean, just to finish that, uh, that piece out then. So were you did you become a philosopher with an interest in politics or a political theorist with an interest in philosophy? Where was your main? Well, eventually, definitely, I would describe myself as a as a political theorist rather than a political philosopher. Um, and that is kind of, um, I suppose, pushing me away from the kind of more moral philosophy side of political theory and more towards the political theory that's very much engaged with with contemporary philosophy. But I mean, in terms of in insofar as how I was thinking at the time, um, as I say, I, 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 I was much more enthralled, certainly by my third year, by the philosophy part of my degree, but actually went on to study uh, politics rather than philosophy. A number of reasons for that. Um, one was that uh, in my third year, I did a I did a politics course which did actually inspire me. It was it was by a professor called Richard Hodder Williams who taught a course on politics on African politics, and um, I think it was it was like the first time I'd realised that the study of politics. Is partly about trying to understand change, you know. So it was a, it was about colonialism, nationalist movements, decolonization, why it is that some countries then became subject to military coups and so on. Also, he got us reading the Heinemann African Writers series, people like Chinua Achebe. Um, so so then I so that was really what decided me to when I went on to the next stage very last minute that I decided to go on to. I think at every stage along my career, I didn't think more than six months ahead. And then I realized the degree was coming to an end. What was I going to do? And I must, I should apply for a master's degree. Um, but it, it's, I, I think there's also an element of, you know, this is late six, this is early seventies, right? Um, I, I've talked to quite a lot of women of my generation from that period. We were. We didn't think we were clever enough for philosophy. Um, it was we were given the impression <laughs> that we weren't clever enough for philosophy. So even though it was the part that I uh, was most enthralled by during my undergraduate years, it kind of seemed a bit risky to put your, you know put yourself forward as someone who wanted to be a philosopher, but to put yourself forward as someone who wanted to study politics that seemed that seemed plausible. I think and I hope that that has changed since. Hmm. That's interesting, yeah. I mean, um, I, I imagine you were taught in the analytic tradition, which was mainly male-dominated. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I mean, were, were you looking at people like Anscombe and Philip uh, Yes, yeah, but... Rather like, than, for like example, Du Bois. Like Lyle. Um, I mean, some of it very, very dry. Yeah. Um, that, there, there was a lecturer uh, at, at Bristol who was very into Wittgenstein, but I didn't quite get into Wittgenstein at the time. I, you know, I think that might have opened up in different directions. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it was the, um, it was more the kind of the metaphysics that most grabbed me at the time, the kind of puzzle of how we know what we know. That seemed yeah. really fascinating. Was that Corner? Was he the? Yes, he the Stefan, Stefan like Corner. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he was, uh, I mean, he was a very, um, so this kind of very fierce, uh, intimidating uh, Kantian. Um, he at, in, at, at the time they had the um, uh, a very good tradition, which is that the most senior professor would give the first year introductory lectures. Um, so we had Kerner for our all of our first year lectures. I never had him as a seminar tutor, uh, but he made a, a huge impression on, on me. Not as someone I particularly liked, but as someone who had this fierce, fierce commitment to ideas. I mean, ideas were not a game to him. He was really kind of, uh, he represented a kind of uh, just total immersion in ideas. And I remember, um, I say he was very intimidating, but there was one moment in his first year lectures when one of the students um, 
uh, raised his hand and said, um, oh, Professor Kerner, I, I'm not quite happy with this distinction between, and kind of broke in and said, it is not my role to make you happy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after that, I thought, well, I'm certainly not asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yes, he actually he made quite an he had quite an impact on me just because of that sense that he conveyed about about the seriousness of intellectual um, investigations. Um, so yes, and he actually he actually was a full blown Kantian, was he? He thought Kantian was the. Yeah. Was well, if he wasn't, I would not have been able to tell the difference. But yes, he really was. I think he was. Okay. So, um, so after Bristol, you decide to go and do a master's in the School of Oriental and African Studies, which at the time was, you know, a very good school. I believe I think it's since um, been amalgamated. But and then you did your PhD at the City University of London. Yes. Yeah. No. So um, I was still an independent universe, independent part of the um, University of London. Oh, okay. Um, so before we go into your studies, let's just uh, talk about London. You arrive in London in the early 70s. What was your sense? That, that was a big city as opposed to Bristol. Um, so what was your sense of it there? Uh, well, uh, actually, when I left Bristol, I thought I'd be going back there every weekend because I had loved my, particularly my final year in Bristol. In fact, I hardly went back at all because once I got to London, I just, it was, it was very exciting. <laughs> uh, it was... Uh, it was very political in SOAS. Uh, you know, it was a place where a lot of people who um, were either from the still colonized or recently decolonized parts of the world, uh, but also more widely, this was this is the 70s, right? This is the early 70s, I moved to London. It's the beginning of the women's liberation movement. So there are all these conferences and workshops and demonstrations and campaigns. It's also a time of a a re-engagement with Marxism. So it's the time when a lot of the early writings of Marx are being published. Um, so there's a whole kind of discussion about, you know, the humanist Marx versus the more scientific Marx. Uh, so the influence of Louis Althusser and Etienne Balabar. So I, I mean, I became involved both in um, women's movement workshops and conferences, but also in a capital reading group doing very close reading of volume one of Capital. Um, yeah, it was a very heady time. Um, so actually, so I moved to London in 1971 and basically I've lived in London ever since. Um, um, yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, it was good. So you you end up doing your, your doctoral thesis on um, colonial policy yeah. in West, West British, uh, British West Africa. Yeah. Um, so it sounds I could see why you would have got into that decolonization was happening. It was a live issue. Yes. Yeah. And you had yeah. indicated even in your undergraduate years, you were, you were drawn to that, but that, that yeah. of course you did. Um, so did that, when you got into it really seriously, did it throw up any surprises or what were the big discoveries you found in that doctoral thesis? Well, I suppose I discovered uh, the kind of the delights of detective work in in archives, which is it's the only period in my life when I've done any of that kind of work. But uh, tracing stories through the colonial office uh, archives. I mean, I I uh, I mean, obviously, I got the I, I sort of got the idea of doing it when I was doing my master's degree because I came across uh, this book by uh, Jeffrey Kay, The Political Economy of Colonialism in Ghana, which was arguing that if you think about what's going on in that particular um, uh, particular colony, what you see is an incredible mess that the administrators make of things because they're constantly trying to kind of push a, a, a vision of agricultural development, which, which has no understanding at all of the kinds of conditions or the social relations or the possibilities. Um, and for me, it kind of connected with a, um, so as I say, I'd been, I'd been, I'd been doing a lot of, um, uh, I mean, I, I was reading a lot of Marx and I was kind of quite a purist in my Marxism and quite critical of some of the strands of neo-Marxism that were around at the time. So, uh, in, in the area of development, it was the time when a lot of people were talking about the, the development of underdevelopment, which was a phrase that Andre Gunder Frank came up with, which was an argument that the basically that that 
that capitalism had underdeveloped the parts of the world that it had colonized. Um, and as a more purist Marxist, I thought something weird about that because you know what Marx tells us is that um, you know is that basically uh, capitalism is this capitalism tears down old prejudices. Capitalism compels the rest of the world under pain of extinction, extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. That's the image you get from a, from Marx. Um, why? Why wouldn't the colonial empires have just forged ahead and kind of turned everything into capitalist capitalism in the image of their of the centers? And uh, so my study of the colonial archives, um, in a way, confirmed what what uh, Jeffrey Kay had argued. I, I went to study with him at Jeff City University. He was my supervisor, which is that there's something about the I mean, they did try to do that. I mean, they, you know, 1880s, 1890s, they came in with visions of, you know, we're going to force everyone into private property. We're going to set up kind of mining development, plantations. Everyone's going to become a wage laborer. Actually, they had a skeleton staff. This was not a settler part of the colonial world. Um, they were they were totally dependent on forming alliances with uh, local chiefs. Um, they, they were facing possibility of serious resistance and they retreated to a very different idea of, of what they would try to do with a very romanticized idea of, you know, happy peasants kind of, you know, producing cocoa for the world market. Um, so it was, a, it was a story about a kind of a failure <laughs> to develop the kind of capitalism that they would have loved to develop. Um, anyway, I, I, I sort of... Uh, so it was it was about the kind of the failure, the weakness of the of the colonial state. Curiously, my I mean, I, I went to study with with Jeff Kay because he'd written this book. As happens, this is always something that when people go and choose somebody as their supervisor, you very often get the supervisor at the time when they've actually lost interest in mm. what you went to study them with them. He was he was got me reading. Hegel and Keynes in my first year. That was what he was obsessed with. So I did a lot of Hegel reading as well as, as well as Marx. Though I think Hegel didn't um, stick with me quite, um, quite so much. So. Okay, that's that's interesting. I mean, there's two questions that probably uh, you prompted me to ask now on, on that topic. One to do with your thesis. So you indicate there that you were kind of a pure Marxist mm, at that mm -hmm. moment, yeah. And then when you read the you were slightly skeptical of this underdevelopment thesis. Yeah. And then you went into the archives and maybe it wasn't underdevelopment through design more through necessity or incompetence. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, would be a um, way of putting it, yeah. So my first question would be, so did that in some way undermine your faith in pure Marxism or theory? Uh, that's the first one. Or did you start getting more skeptical of Marxism? Or was it, no, oh, he's still mainly right. It was just a little area he got that wrong. So that's my first question. Yes, yeah. Well, I think I think the scepticism about Marxism uh, came up much more through the through the feminist route. So uh, I the story I told about colonialism in West Africa, in fact, used the weakness of the colonial state to basically confirm that if capitalism could only have it its way, it would indeed have you know forced all countries under pain of extinction uh, to develop in its own image. But, uh, uh, but there are certain social historical conditions, which actually is entirely compatible with, with Marx's analysis. So the, you know, the skepticism, I mean, there was a lot of discussion in the 70s when quite a lot of the people who were, who were feminists came through a socialist or indeed a Marxist tradition. But, you know, having to having to kind of grapple with, um, you know, sometimes quite conflicting uh, ways of understanding the world. So there's a lot of discussion through the 70s about that. And I, I mean, I, I think Marx has continued to be a very important influence in me, but, but certainly the idea of um, actually, I have no interest in trying to rescue Marx from things where I think his analysis doesn't help, but I think the, the you know I still think the fundamental analysis of capitalism kind of carries a huge amount of weight. But the but yeah I, the, the skepticism came more th 
through uh, my involvement in feminist politics through the 70s and 80s than, than through anything that I discovered in the, uh, in the thesis, in the work for the thesis. Okay. Um, the other question, a bit broader, kind of, you know, kind of going a bit more forward, there's, there's been a kind of a more recent years, an emerging kind of, you could call a reassessment of colonialism. Yes. Uh, um, yeah. And uh, which just takes a more ambivalent attitude towards it. Um, so, you know, we went from colonialism being brilliant. Um, then we got go into the, no, it wasn't brilliant. It was mainly terrible. And now we've gone to a new place where, well, it's a bit more nuanced than that. And even people saying it was better than it was worse, that it brought a level of, you know, things like rule of law. It wasn't just all bad. It wasn't all exploitative. What's your view of where that debate's gone? Well, I think that the other aspect that's also come out quite strongly is the, the violence in colonialism. I think there's been, uh, which I... I mean, it's one of the things I regret about the kind of the work that I did on colonialism, that uh, of course I knew it was violent, but somehow didn't, didn't dwell on that. But if you actually go into the violence of colonialism, it, it is actually quite um, the, the daily violence of the forced labor, the kind of the, the kind of the violence of the kind of the, the more symbolic violence of treating people as lesser beings, but but you know also the kind of the you know the the violence in terms of uh, uh, the way people the beatings that I mean it's uh, so actually my my I've been I've been more struck by there is also a kind of alongside this different balance sheets that people draw draw up about colonialism there's also um, I think more. Um, exploration and ex, you know and uh, ex exposure of the the kind of violence um so um uh, caroline elkins uh who did the that wonderful book about the the british treatment of the mama movement but also a a later book which looked at how the kind of the the mechanisms of kind of control and counterinsurgency that the british state developed which they used across across Ireland, across Palestine, across tenure, uh, Kenya, and sort of, um, I mean, there's, so there's, a not, there's as well as the balance sheet um, sort of reappraisals, there's also a lot of um, really kind of convincing historical work, which is, uh, which to me, I mean, I'm particularly conscious of it because I'm aware that I didn't think it as enough as I should have done, as much as I should have done about the violence. When I was mm. writing about colonialism, so that's really that's also an important part of the contemporary picture, I think. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, my, my, one of the ways I, I got alerted to the violence was just by reading Orwell, Burmese Days, and you. Yes. Yes. Uh, you saw there, you know, he, now he was a retrospective look back, but he yeah. he realised, God, this was pretty violent. Yeah, and I, absolutely. Yeah. I was an agent of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but people got used to being brutalised. Um, yes, kind of a, a terrible normalization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, and the and the legacy of that um, that's been left to the um, post-colonial countries, you know, is is not um, conducive to um, not conducive to democracy, not conducive to equality. Um, it's not it's not created good conditions for uh, for people to now um, actually develop their lives in the ways that they. I want to. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the um, good things about back in the 70s and 80s was people that are doing their PhDs could also be teaching. Yes. You know, which I think now has stopped. I yes, think, yes. Regrettably, yeah. I think, in a way. But um, you, um, so you started teaching um, at the same time. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested to know what sort of courses you, what freedom you were given to teach and what sort of courses you taught, yes. what your students were like. Yes. You then moved to the poly. Uh, yes, um, yes. Yeah. Maybe you could tell us about that period and what you were up to. Well, it was, uh, I think it was a pretty exciting time in the polytechnic sector, uh, partly because there'd been a rapid expansion of using the polytechnics to develop social science degrees uh, rather than more technical ones. So there was a, a, there was a, a, a huge recruitment of younger um, teachers, younger lecturers, uh, who, who brought 
all kinds of new ideas about what what should be taught, how it should be taught. So it was it was quite a uh, a period of um, uh, experimentation. Uh, so one one of the first courses that I was involved in was a a kind of a, a cross department interdisciplinary. Uh, we called it the basic social science course, um, which all first year students studying social sciences were supposed to take, which they took with considerable grumbling because they were taken through quite kind of high theory about the philosophy of social science um, in ways that didn't always connect with what they thought they'd come to the university, the polytechnic to study. So it was a team taught by people from sociology, politics, geography, psychology. Um, and that was a very, very, um, yeah, that was, to me, that was, I mean, that was great because I, I was working with people across a number of departments. Um, outside, in the polit specifically in the politics department, well, I taught a sort of general, you know, sort of Plato through to Marx type course. Um, but I also had the opportunity to develop new courses of my own um, and even more so when a bit later we introduced a master's program as well as the undergraduate one. So I taught, I introduced a course on the history of feminism called The Rights of Woman based, under, based on starting with Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Woman. I taught a course on politics of developing countries. I taught a course on um, dilemmas of democracy, one on Marx and his 20th century successors. Uh, so there was quite a lot of freedom to introduce new new courses. The students, I mean, the so the really exciting thing about teaching in the polytechnics in those days was that in the country as a whole, there was a pool of students who had that either they'd messed up their A levels for one reason or another, um, or they'd never they'd never gone on to university perhaps they were perhaps they were women in families where the where the parents weren't so encouraging of the girls uh, or they'd got married they'd had children you know and then they really wanted to come back and sort of do some study so the polytechnics took students with lower uh, a level grades than the established universities and and also if you were a mature student you know, maybe you'd done a foundation course, maybe you'd demonstrated your abilities in some other way, you could get in without A-levels. So, and there, were, there was this pool of just really determined, keen, smart students out there who just hadn't had a chance uh, in the more established universities. Um, I mean, I was like my two weeks ahead of them in my reading, you know, I was kind of, uh, you know, barely knew the stuff any better than uh, than they did um and, and but kind of perhaps i don't know we i just almost felt certainly in the early years as though we were just uh yeah it was very it was very challenging and very stimulating it changed because it changed partly because um government policy shifted to having more and more of the age cohort going to uh university uh, so the uh the uh uh, the aim of the Blair government, for example, was to get 50% of, uh, of the age cohort uh, able to go to university. So there's a huge expansion of um, access to universities. This is about the time that the polytechnics were also re-designated um, as universities themselves. And one of the effects of that was that we were in competition with the established universities for these exciting students who were so keen and so determined and you know and so full of ideas uh, so it became over the years much less uh, much less interesting uh, well okay still you still have the kind of amazing experience of seeing the ways in which students transformed in the course of their three-year study um, so it was still yeah and it was still but it was challenging in a different kind of way because there were, you felt you were teaching quite a lot of students who actually, they, they didn't yet have the tools in their first year to really get the best out of the university education. And that was about the time that I, um, yeah, started thinking that I would like to um, move to, um, to a different kind of context. But in the early years, very, very exciting. Mm. Um... 
Well, that's interesting that you and you were probably meeting students with, with a bit more life in them. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. You know, live life. And also willing to challenge their teachers because yes. some of them were older than us yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and they weren't taking any nonsense from us. <laughs> yeah. The, um, just when you're, if we could just stay on that topic a little bit longer, because I, I'm quite intrigued about university education. Yes. Uh, because on one level, you could say it's, you know, it's very detached. You've got the lecturer standing up, giving his or her lecture. And a lot of lectures like that performance. It's kind of a performance art. Yes. Yeah. And they don't really have to engage. And it's kind of, you know, the students look at them almost, you know, he's glowing, semi god kind of uh, being who's telling them the truth. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And that's a, still a big part of the university education, the lecture. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have seminars. And then in certain universities, not many, you have the one to one tutorials, which is more of an Oxbridge thing, I think, which there's yes, sort of flowing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for my time, I remember teaching. The only way I really felt I was engaging was with, with students was through their essays, and I put a lot of work into, you know, comments on their essays. Yes. Yeah. And then smaller seminars, but apart from that, it wasn't really a what you call a teaching engagement. Um, I mean, did you have you come up? Have you have you developed your views on that over the years? What's the best way to help people think for themselves and? Yes, you, yes. How, how do you approach this? <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm impressed by you saying that you you felt that you most engaged with the students in your in your sort of in, with their essays because uh, that to me became the worst part of the job, the the kind of reading and marking the essays. But you were obviously a model teacher, right? Um, I I I think the. I always saw the point of the, the lectures. I, I, I like giving lectures. Uh, I like the kind of the, well, I like the fact that it's me and I can kind of prepare for it and I can do the performance and so on. But what I always thought that the point of the lectures was, was, was not to, not so much to impart knowledge to students, but to, to get them to see that there was an issue that they needed to think about and that, uh, in in the existing literature, people had thought about it in often very uh, conflicting conflicting ways, and that you know they needed to somehow work their way through this. So I, I think I always I came to see not always I came to see the lecture as in a way about just um, inspiring people to recognise that there was something that they needed to turn their minds to and to get to grips with, and then I saw the the seminars as, as the occasion where uh, you could um, actually try and engage with the, the very different ways in which people have tried to address that issue. So that, that really became my, um, my way of thinking about it. But of course, that's easier to do. Yeah, if you're in philosophy, if you're in political theory, I mean, it's a kind of quite obvious way to think about what teaching is about. Uh, there are lots of other, I suppose, disciplines where that approach doesn't work so well. Hmm. But and but also the other thing is that I guess that the, I mean I'm talking particularly about the way I came to think about my teaching once I moved to LSE and we, um, yeah, I was fortunate at LSE because I would tend to have students who, when they were told to go off and do some reading, actually most of them would do it. Um, this isn't the experience of, of, of you know, of all, um, all universities, you know, partly because, you know, there's a lot of students who are actually having to work part time in order to finance themselves and they can only do a, a very small part of the, of the reading or, you know, for whatever reason. Um, so that my, I mean, my practice of teaching really did depend on the students going off and getting the information themselves because I wasn't going to impart. A huge amount of information. I was going to kind of like alert alert them to why this matters and look at the different kinds of ways in which people have have tried to answer the questions and uh, you know why some might why some might be better than others. Yeah, I mean I'm not saying that I didn't try to suggest that some were better than others, but mm. yeah, um, I, I, I suppose my last question this then before we start now looking at you know how your career developed was. Yeah. Another thing that kind of emerges is um, 
you know, clever people and committed people. Yes. Um, so you can get people that are very clever uh, and, and they just stay that way. They just stay clever. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And they, and because they get lazy, because they just rely on their cleverness. And then you get people that may not be as clever, but get completely into the subject. And yes. end up almost compensating for their lack of cleverness. Yeah. Tenfold by just getting into the subject and pure hard work, sweat. Yeah. Um, where do you rate the cleverness commitment ratio? And have you, has that, that's yeah. something that, you know, in your career, have you seen much of that? Or do you think you need both? And that's the end of it. Well, I do, yeah, I think, um, I think one of the distinctions that I would make is, is kind of, uh, there's also scholarship. I mean, I, I think that there's a, there's a kind of way of thinking where people will go very deep into something and they will really, um, they will ensure that they have really covered all aspects before they, before they venture um, a judgment about it. I have to say, I've never been quite in that category myself. I like to get to, get to things a bit faster. I have enormous respect for the people who, who actually, who take their time over that, over that scholarship and, and really kind of um, work through something. So that's another kind of category. And I mean, that's, that's that, the commitment there is to ensuring that what you do really is grounded in having thoroughly um, covered the possibilities in the ground. Uh, whereas um, the kind of commitment that has been more important to me is a commitment to um, addressing important issues and trying to um, Trying, trying to make a contribution to uh, ways of understanding them. Um, so th those are different kinds of cleverness, mm -hmm. and you often don't get the same kind, of, that, that ki the same kind of cleverness in, in, in one person. I think there are lots of different forms of cleverness. Um, okay, good. Um, if we, I mean, when I was preparing for this interview, um, I was thinking, well, what's the best way to ask Anne about her career because it's there's different ways you could look at it sequentially and i said now that's we'd just be doing one book after another i'm not sure there's connections so i thought that would be not a good way of doing it um so then i thought about let's do it thematically mm -hmm. um so that's the way we're going to maybe discuss your work but and I, for me the first theme is that emerges probably from the 80s maybe even later is you you you, you become clearly a, a feminist political theorist. That's how you mm -hmm. describe yourself, mm -hmm. and I think that's how you like to be described. <laughs> so I'd like to start with that, and then we'll move on to your views on things like equality, democracy, yes, culture, yeah. Yeah. and what you call the human. Yeah. Um, so if we start, if we just sort of um, start with feminist political theorist, um, I'd like to start with the second two parts, political theory. Um, I'm thinking about that in the 70s and 80s when you yes. were to it. So I think it's, it's developed a lot over the years. Yes. So yeah. what did you think was good and bad about political theory in that period? Um, let's start with there. Right. So, I mean, I think, I think you should bear in mind that actually, particularly in the 1970s, a lot of it passed me by. Um, so I I, I, leave, I I finished my undergraduate degree in 1971, like the year in which uh, John Rawls publishes A Theory of Justice. I, I just wasn't really aware of Rawls and the reception of his ideas, for example, through the 1970s. And to the extent that I was reading um, Anglophone political theory in that period, it was mainly democratic theory um, that I was reading. So, um, and, and the thing about democratic theory is that uh, it it's uh, it tends to be much more grounded than a lot of philosophical work. I mean, it's dealing with, you know, what people have done, not done, what empowers, what disempowers. So, um, so one of the books that uh, influenced me at the time was um, uh, Jane Mand Jane Mansbridge's book Beyond Adversary Democracy, which, um, I mean, Jane Man Mansbridge is. Uh, 
I mean, she's not in the kind of analytic tradition that tries to, you know, derive eth ethical principles from thought experiments or um, or imagined reconstructions of what rational people would rationally do. She's looking at actual examples of democratic organization and testing out their strengths and weaknesses. So, um, so I don't really have any particular view good or bad <laughs> about political theory in general. But it's true that when I when I did begin to form a view, it was really through the lens of feminism. Um, so <clears throat> the, I mean, feminist theory, there was a whole uh, flourishing of feminist theory all the way through the 1970s. And, it, and the kind of feminist theory I was reading initially was was very interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, you know, anthropology, history, literature, uh, philosophy, um, economics. For me, it was the uh, the sort of the second half of the 1980s is the point at which you get the formation of a of a feminist political theory. So that's feminist, but it's very focused on political theory. Um, so I'm thinking of things like uh, Susan Moller Okin's Justice, Gender and the Family. Um, uh, uh, Iris Young's Justice and the Politics of Difference, uh, Carol Pateman, The Sexual Contract, these all, these all come out at roughly the same time. And they're engaging with mainstream political theory, whereas a lot of the feminist theory previously either was internal debates within feminism or was just challenging society in general or was, or was challenging literary works. There was a lot of that. But this was focusing on some of the, I mean, if you think of Susan Moller Oaken, her often excoriating critiques of McIntyre or um, uh, Sandal uh, Rawls. Um, so so, so all, of that's, all of that's going on. So that's the point at which, I mean, I'm not, I can't remember at what point I started actually describing myself as a feminist political theorist, but that's the point for me where feminist political theory as a, as a specific subfield of political theory and a specific subfield of feminist theory really uh, really comes into existence and and that's um yeah that that's where i kind of um yeah that's where i kind of felt i um yeah that's where i felt i kind of placed myself and and uh, you know wanted to contribute to that which which i saw as contributing both to um, both to the critique of what happens in political theory in general if you don't take seriously uh, the gendered nature of power relations. So that critique of mainstream theory, but at the same time, um, a, a sort of engaging in, I suppose, bringing political theory to the feminist debate. So drawing on traditions within political theory to address uh crucial issues in feminism so you know for example um for something i wrote about later uh whether 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 one should think of um of freedom as involving um self ownership as involving uh, being whether control and autonomy meant owning your own body or whether the idea of owning your own body is a sort of a terribly impoverished way of of thinking about freedom. So, so yeah, both um, feminist political theory as both a uh, engaging in what needs to change within political theory once you start thinking about gendered power relations, but also drawing on ideas in political theory to contribute to debates, uh, quite pressing debates within within feminism. So. As I say, I'm not sure at what point I started describing myself as a feminist political theorist, but but certainly looking back, that's the point at which, to me, it 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 sort of it it comes into comes into focus as uh, as what I what I want what I want to be part of and how I see myself, uh, how I see my ideas. Hmm. Okay, maybe let's maybe if you just dig into that a bit more, especially for people who aren't familiar with. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. I mean, one of the things that I think emerges very closely from your, if we look at political theory yeah. uh, in two ways, style and substance. For me, 
the style of, let's call it anglophone political theory, mm -hmm. uh, prides itself in its kind of rigor, its clarity, its lucidity, um, its view that you know you must follow the truth. I mean, all, all a lot mm -hmm. of people, all inquiries would like to think that, but um, so you've got that, and I can see why that would be different to other uh, discussions within feminism, which mightn't uh, put as much emphasis on those uh, epistemic virtues, if you like want to call them that, uh, that you have to be clear, you have to be rigorous uh, in your pre presentation. And then on the more substance side, you say, yes, but that's fine. But I like that. And I want to apply that. But when I look at Anglophone political theory, it's got so many shortcomings from a feminist point of view that I want to see if we can address so that we can look at the sort of things that uh, traditional political theory is looking at in mm -hmm. a much more um, uh, richer way that does justice mm -hmm. to the gender, to gender issues and other issues. Yes. Yeah. So maybe if we can say a little bit about why, what, what attracted you to the style first and then maybe a little bit more on the substance. Well, can I can I just pick up the point about rigor because it seems to me that what the what the feminist theorists are are have been are arguing is pointing to a lack of rigor in forms of political theorizing or forms of political philosophizing that work with with a level of abstraction that simply doesn't recognize that we live under gendered power relations. So this is this is a central theme in the, um, certainly the feminist theorists who've had uh, most influence on me. So the, the idea that, um, uh, the, the idea, so for example, in Carol Pateman, uh, the idea that the kind of the very, um, the very, the, the abstraction from gender difference that goes into, the notion of the liberal individual means that that philosophers work with a notion of the liberal individual into which they have smuggled all kinds of assumptions which reflect those gendered power relations so that she she argues that the you know the supposedly abstract figure of the individual actually gets what gets smuggled into this is what she describes as a a masculine conception of the individual as owner so that what seems to be rigorous and rigorous because it's abstract, because it's abstracted from the, you know, the kind of the complexity of, of daily life. It seems to be rigorous because of that. But in fact, in the process of that abstraction, it's actually smuggled in so many assumptions that that then already bias it in certain directions. So um, that, that, that to me is a kind of central theme in the ways in which feminist political theorists have, uh, have developed. So um, so certainly there's a difference. I mean, you could say there's a difference from mainstream theory in that, in a sense, in defining yourself or thinking of yourself as a feminist political theorist, you've made a, uh, you've, you've, you've made a particular political claim, right? Mm -hmm. You've said, said, I think, you know, from the beginning, <laughs> that there is gender power and it's a problem, right? So in a sense, you're not leaving that open as a something that you might find out at the end of the investigation um so that that I, indeed is is different from the way in which um the, the kind of the investigative process that a more mainstream theorist or philosopher might pursue so i i definitely take that point um but in terms of uh, the kind of the rigor i think the argument goes the other way i think there's a lack, a lack of rigor in those who work too happily with the idea of the individual, the citizen, the human, um, without actually um, thinking about what difference would it make to your arguments if you thought of this individual or citizen or human as a woman rather than as a man. And if it would make a difference, you need to actually think about that <laughs> and do some rigorous rethinking of the process. I mean, yeah. Um, I, I think you're, uh, there is, um, yeah, I was just thinking about your language point, luc uh, lucidity, um, which is, uh, I mean, certainly not true, of, uh, not, not an issue for Susan Moller-Oaken, who's uh, impeccably clear 
Um, people often say this about Judith Butler, that uh, her her language is, um, and and it is true that you you early particularly her a lot of her writing is it's as though it's as though she's searching for ways to say things that are so, so different from what has been said before but it goes through rather circuitous routes and you're not quite sure what she's saying. Curious thing about Judith Butler is that you ever hear her give a, a lecture, she is absolutely crystal clear. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite striking, yeah. Interesting, okay, that's good because, you know, the, you, 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 and that's one thing that's very powerful about your work, you, you take on, um, you question a lot more than a lot of people would think are worth questioning, things like, you just point out the spuriousness of some of the rigor, the concept of rigor yes, that's there yeah. in the first place, that it's 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 engendered in a way that you really have to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean, even things like you say, lucidity could be as well. Lucidity yes. mightn't be the virtue you yeah. think it is, because it might actually bake in a certain view of yes. lucidity that only makes certain discourse possible. Yeah, or refuses um, to follow certain kind of avenues that that would complicate the uh, the story. Yeah, exactly. So therefore, the criticism that you know Butler is opaque might yes. actually be a compliment. Yes. Yeah, in spite of itself. Yes. <laughs> um, but um, okay, so good. So I mean, when you kind of in the nineties, maybe even the late eighties, nineties, you, you you know you're, you're becoming a feminist political theorist. And then it, it, it seems to me that, yes, you kind of, you know where, the, 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 now, that, now that I've made that insight, mm. I'm now going to look at the, the terrain, where mm. I, I imagine there's all sorts of things done wrong, misunderstood, and that have impacts. Yeah. And you don't have to do a big empirical analysis to find that out. You almost know from the start, and now I'm going to lay it out for people to read. Um, I don't think that's saying you've made your mind up before, You've, you've looked at the yeah, terrain. Yeah. It's just you know enough to know that. Yes. Yeah. And now I'm going to look at things like democracy, equality, yes, yes, the human, yeah. and and can it show how we got this wrong yes, and where we need to yeah, correct it? Yeah. From a feminist point of view, and I, I I also from reading your books from a broader than a feminist point of view, there's more than feminism going on here. There's it's more capacious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, if the, I mean, is that a right characterization of where you were, like by the nineties, that you had made that insight, uh, and now was a, now you have a kind of over the next twenty or thirty years now, I want to focus on looking at certain key concepts and show how they need to be redeemed. Well, I I suppose uh, I suppose the kind of the idea that. One in almost any area of investigation, you need to think about what difference it makes if you put gender more firmly in the picture. Yes, that's a kind of almost like whatever you're looking at, have that as one of the kind of central questions. But but beyond that, I mean, I would say that that sort of like, I mean, everything I've kind of worked on over the years or written about over the years, it's almost I would say it's always come out of something that I'm not quite sure about. Um, so it's come out of something that I I need to think about how to th usually how to balance two different directions that seem very compelling. So I go I you know the the first kind of substantial body of work that I do um, as a kind of feminist political theorist is around issues of democracy, and I think one of the um, central uh, tensions that um, that I I've, I confront in democracy and I, I uh, is still something that uh, you know it seems to me quite central in thinking about it is the is the tension between political equality, which um, which drives you in the direction of things like voting or things like referendums or something where every citizen has a kind of equal right to participate. Um, political equality and popular control, which drives you more in the direction of how do we participate? How do we get actually actively involved in, in the decisions that so much affect our lives? And I think that uh, 
that that kind of tension between the more you go in a a more participatory direction. This is this is also something that was very much in um, Jane Mansbridge's book, which I kind of said I was kind of quite uh, influenced by. So she looked at um, she looked at various examples of sort of more face to face democratic contexts. You know, like town um, uh, town hall meetings in Vermont, uh, uh, a participatory workplace. Um, uh, I can't remember the the example she looks at, but in in looking at them, she's looking at how the the ideal of trying to have a more participatory democracy. In practice, it actually can reproduce power structures. It can give more power to those who are more active. Um, it you know it there's a tension built into our ideals of democracy. So so the political theorist David Beaton once described democracy not in, in institutional terms, but as a combination of political equality and popular control. And I find that quite useful, but it's a combination, you know, so it's a combination between this astonishing idea that all of us, regardless of wealth, gender, race, religion, all of us have, you know, an equal right to contribute to, to shape the decisions that affect our lives. A combination of that, and the notion of actually trying to effect some kind of control over those decisions. And as I say, it, it, this, this puts you between two things that you want to bring together, but they can push against one another. And so, so my work on democracy, yes, it's kind of, it's, um, it, it's, it's framed all the way through by what difference does it make if you put gender more firmly into the picture. Mm. But it's also framed by this question about how can you have a, demo a democracy which is more substantially participatory, in which we really do feel we have more control than just every five years casting a vote in elections. But at the same time, one that recognizes us all as having a voice and all as political equals. And so, I mean, I became known as someone who wrote about representation, you know, because my my really probably my most influential book, The Politics of Presence, mm -hmm. is about um, uh, how you manage to uh, change the composition of our decision making assemblies, our parliaments, our national assemblies in ways that more adequately reflects the gender composition, the ethnic composition, uh, the you know whatever are the kind of major social uh, divisions within the society. But it's not that I think what matters is representation and participation is a kind of minor irrelevancy. It's as though I, I kind of moved in that direction because of becoming aware of you can't just call for a more participatory democracy and more localized face-to-face small-scale meetings where everyone can be involved because everyone never is involved in those meetings. So you've got to think about mechanisms of representation, which in principle are available to all of us. And so then I became very focused on, okay, so what would political equality mean if you thought not just about ensuring that all men and women have the equal right to vote, but what if you thought all men and women actually have a re an equal possibility of being uh, among the decision makers? Um, but it's it's uh, it's it's not it's not as though I know in I know I know I know from the start that putting gender into the picture is going to make a difference, but I don't know from the start, and I don't know at the end either, what really is what we should be aiming for in terms of um, a, a kind of vital and substantial system of democracy. Yes, very good. I mean, um, what, because one of the things that lessons that I've, I've learned from reading your work is there's sometimes there's a sense that God, things are, can get overwhelming here. Mm -hmm. Here we start off with a concept like democracy, which if you look at the traditional concepts of democracy and the analysis of them, even by Dave, someone like David Beaton that you mentioned, there's, you get a, sometimes a sense, oh good, I, now I understand it. Yes. It's yeah. artificially neat, right? Whereas when I read your books, I find, 
no, no, Antelopes has gone into a topic here, and now it's much more messy. Yes, it's yes, much more yes. difficult to get a, a conceptual yeah. handle on this yeah. that's yeah. going to be faithful to reality. Yeah. And not just reality, but the possibility of a better reality. Yeah. Yeah. Because as you, you just said there, once you look at democracy as, well, political equality in that very formal sense, you know, we've got rights. Yeah. And, and then you look at it from a participatory way. You could actually work on getting us more participatory, mm. but unintentionally, yeah. but almost inevitably reproducing yeah. a patriarchal yeah. participatory. Yes. Because yeah. the deeper stuff hasn't changed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it requires much more work. So therefore, it could, when I read your books on democracy, it becomes a much bigger problem than democracy. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a societal issue here. We've got his, historical legacy issues here. Yeah. We've got problems with equality that are all relevant here. And if you want to talk about democracy, you have to bring them all in, yes. which can make it overwhelming. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, so that, so that, which so, is then part of what what you're pointing to in terms of. Uh, different kinds of writing which either seem to very very clearly cut through problems and other ones which actually seem to make it more and more complicated and yes. uh, and uh, yeah yeah i i remember uh, when i first uh, taught a course on uh, on democracy um i that uh, which started with the kind of the the challenge of we live in very feeble democracies you know clearly we have you know, it's so far short from any ideal of democracy. How can we get a more substantial democracy? And I, I, I organised the course around. Well, maybe referendums are the answer. This is all pre-Brexit, but there's a lot already a lot of literature on difficulties with refer referendums. Maybe uh, a more localised democracy. I, I mean, I went through the various various ways in which people have tried to think about how we can make democracy more substantial and I remember one of the students saying at the end of it so now now I'm more confused and depressed than I was at the beginning um, which was not my intention but it's it's kind of uh, but it is yeah there aren't simple answers to um, the questions that really matter mm. yes I mean um, I mean one of the things that actually just before while we're on the topic of democracy um, so you've got ideals, and then you've got reality. Mm. And even when you even when you start thinking about the ideals or the idea of democracy, it's more complicated the more you get into it. Um, and then you've got the reality, which a lot of people think is lamentably short mm. of what it should mm. be. Mm. In a lot of your work, you, you so you say, okay, how do we how do we get a better picture, a better grasp of purchase on what we want to look at here? History is becoming more and more important politically. Mm. In the sense, not in any kind of facile way, but where we just look at the past and we get a we get a blueprint for how we should do it. Yes, yeah. For example, ancient classical Greek democracy. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. if you look at a book like, for example, Moses Finley's Democracy, Ancient and Modern. Yes. Yeah. It's sufficiently nuanced to say, okay, if there's lessons here to be learned. Yeah. When you compare it with contemporary democracy, but there are lessons that complicate the picture. Yeah. yeah. And also show there's certain stuff we've lost back then that we can't regain because yes. you know yes. that's what history teaches as well it's in a yes. much more complex way yes. you can't reproduce the past yes. Yes. but you can still learn from the past yeah um, i mean have you found history instructive in that regard well i have found his i've i've come to um make much more use of history and history of political thought in my in my work in the sort of last 10, 15 years. Um, instructive, um, I suppose I've been focusing less on ways in which history provides us with warnings or lessons, um, but more, well, warnings maybe. What, what we see in history in terms of, I don't know, what it reveals about things that got baked into what looked like already very um, ambitious ideals. So, so this, is, this particularly uh, relates to um, some of the work I've done on equality recently, where um, of course, through, through, the, through the feminist literature, I'm thoroughly aware that uh, when people 
talked about the rights of man, of course, they did actually mean the rights of man, uh, that when people talked about um, all men are born equal, um, they actually did mean all men are born equal. Um, so that I, I'm, I'm thoroughly aware that when people talked about freedom and equality and democracy, what they had in mind was freedom and equality and democracy for what they thought of as the individuals of their society who were always men. Of course, I know that. and I've known that for decades. But the more you think about it, what you actually see is that people, there, there's this whole language of equality, particularly through what we call the modern period. And I suppose I'm thinking, you know, particularly you know, the last four centuries, increasingly powerful languages of equality, which historically coexisted with a tolerance of slavery, a tolerance of colonialism. So it's not just women who are being excluded from this picture. It's the poor, it's the black, it's the enslaved. It's, um, it's, it's actually the majority of, of humankind who are excluded from the remit of equality. So being more aware of the, actually the very disturbing history of some of our wonderful concepts like equality, um, which for me is is probably the most uh, compelling ideal in our in our lives. But if but to think about why the history of it has been so much a history of inequality and exclusion is is certainly um, it it provides us with a lesson. Um, about how we might be reproducing some of that today. Um, so for me, I suppose history, it, as you say, it, it can't be looking in history for models that we could simply pull out of a very different, you know, socio-economic conditions and transplant. So it's not looking for models. Um, it's to some extent looking at things that went wrong when people tried one thing rather than another. Um, but an awful lot of it is looking at the kind of the, the ways, the, the sort of the double and triple and quadruple thinking that went on <laughs> in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the sort of the complacency with which people historically claimed certain ideas without apparently being able to see what they were excluding at the same time. So I suppose that's that that's mainly the way that history has become important to me, which is just one of, you know, one of many ways in which one might uh, turn to history for um, for important lessons. Okay. The um because that leads me to the next question, Bill, on, on things you were just saying there, you know, if if we want to say that history is not the story told by a fool, that there is, let's say we do want to posit that, well, with all its, with all its shortcomings and all its errors, we, we, are, we are seeing some sort of progress happening here. For example, the essence of equality is, is a good thing, and it's better than inequality, which preceded it mainly. Even if, it's, even if it still remains only an ideal that is very, very imperfectly um, you know, realized in, in, and even then in only certain parts mm, of the world. Mm, mm. So, if we want to do that, and then we say, okay, what's the best way to make us make that idea more real, real, real for people in, in that really full, richer way and try and limit the shortcomings of how we've interpreted it? For example, as you gave. All men are born equal. So this highly gendered view of what equality mm -hmm. means is for men and not others. And as you say, not blacks, not the poor, mm -hmm. not just a gender thing. Um, I mean, there, there are certain people saying, skeptics would say, look, this is never going to happen. History is a story told by a fool. And you're mm -hmm. foolish to think it's ever going to get any better. Mm -hmm. People aren't interested in the truth or knowledge. Um, and the, the illusion that there is some lovely core of these ideas and that they're just awaiting discovery and implementation is an illusion. You need to stop people giving, filling up people with the idea that these illusions can be achieved. What do you say to someone that gives that view? Maybe not for power reasons. Let's just say they're being honest. They just said, I've read history for the last 2000 years. All I see is a history of misery. Mm, yeah, well, <laughs> um, I think 
the thing that the thing that I would say, I mean, my my kind of starting point in answering would be to say, when you look at history, when you look around you today, one thing you, you certainly don't find equality. You don't find equality in terms of people being regarded as equals, and you certainly don't find equality in terms of material uh, equality. But people resist oppression and they resist domination and they resist inequality. I mean, there is, you know, the, the kind of the aspiration, the, 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 or sometimes it just takes the form of resentment, which is not always a very uh, positive uh, political response because it can kind of paralyze you. It's, um, but, but people don't like being told that they are of less importance than others. Um, and I think in that sense, the the kind of there's a sense in which the aspiration towards equality actually remains the the kind of the the ways in which people practice equality is very double edged. And I think the ideal itself, you know, people pretend that the ideal is more fully realized than than it is. But but the aspiration. So I've, I've recently been reading um, Darren McMahon's uh, uh, book, which is I can't remember the exact title, but it's something like an elusive history, of, a history of the elusive idea of equality. And he starts it with um, uh, st uh, cave paintings discovered in a, a. This is like I don't know how many millennia ago this is discovered in a cave in uh, in Spain near Valencia. Um, and the uh, archaeologists think that the, the paintings depict uh, a community throwing out, you know, actually, you know, ostracizing, throwing out, in some cases, killing people who had become upstarts. That is, people who had got above themselves, people who had, you know, who had claimed that they were more important than the other people in the group. Um, and it's 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 a kind of it's a very nice kind of reminder that the kind of the resistance to upstarts <laughs> uh, to the people who think that they are more important than you are that's that's a kind of um, that's a kind of I mean I don't as you know from reading my work I don't go into the but go into sort of claiming human characteristics very much but I do think there is a kind of there there is uh, wherever you go in human societies you find people refusing to be treated as lesser than others. Now, that doesn't translate into organize, organizing society around principles of equality. But I think it also, um, I mean, I, I, I mean another, another, another way of putting this, you know, there's, there's always a literature when it comes to thinking about um, downtrodden women, where uh, uh, people, people, sort of talk about how you know well the, the problem the problem is that women women become happy in their subordination they come to accept it you know they they don't see anything wrong with it um i'm actually very unconvinced by that i think there are ways in which there are conditions where you have to accept your subordination because the opportunities for uh, challenging or changing it are very limited but I am not broadly convinced by this picture of there being whole swathes of people who, you know, who are happy slaves, right? I mean, I just think that's that's a kind of that's a sort of fortunate tale uh, for those who don't care too much about inequality to tell them to tell themselves. So I'm, I mean, really, I mean, what I, what I'm saying here is that uh, yes, the history of inequality. Is a it, the history is the history of the world is the history of inequality. Mm -hmm. So it's a history of misery, but it's a, it's also it's a history of people resisting inequality and claiming equality. And and astonishingly, that happens all through history and in the most unlikely of circumstances. So um, that's where I would start in thinking about um, how to challenge that kind of deep pessimism <laughs> about, yes. about the possibilities of change. Counting though it is. Uh, the, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, um, well, I mean, I, was, I think that what you just said there might be a nice segue into what you talk, what you, you know, a book you call The Human. Yes. Because you mentioned there, you know, well, well you know, I, I don't want to posit 
human characteristics in any kind of absolute way. Yes. I think this, so I'd like just, before we get into how you do think we should interpret the human, let, let me just ask you why you think it's wrong to uh, postulate a conception of human nature as a basis yes. for yes. this yes. Yes. Maybe if you could spell out what you think that's a, that's a bad way of going about yeah. business. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, just, just to connect to what... Um, what we've been talking about more historically. So, so historically, um, I, I think my argument, but it's not just my argument, it's very clear. Historically, people talked about, taught the language of equality, but actually they had an image of a particular kind of human being in mind. And this human being was not female. Uh, this human being was not black. This human being didn't live in Africa or Asia. They had a particular image of a human being in mind. And when they said equality, all are born equal, that was the human being they had in mind. That's been very clear through history as the way in which um, ideas of equality were attached to a very specific kind of human. It sounded as if they were talking about everyone, but actually they weren't. That we know from history. It seems to me that some of the kind of the philosophical work that goes on at the moment in relation to equality um, and indeed a lot of popular thinking about the human and equality, risks reproducing all of that. So, um, so for, for a long time, the, the egalitarian literature was sort of dominated by a kind of completely misleading assumption that we all now think, we all now believe in equality. Uh, this is, you know, in the argument is, you know, this is now kind of just the common sense of the modern world. <laughs> Uh, but where we disagree is about equality of what, you know, what what kind what kind of equality we're we talking about. Should we be equalizing resources? Should we be equalizing people's sense of well-being? Equalizing opportunities and so on and so forth. So there was a long period of a sort of discussion about roundly, broadly, on the assumption that we believe in equality, but we disagree about what we should be equalizing. And then um, things shifted. Uh, more recently, and people started saying, well, actually, the prior question is, why should we believe in equality? And then you get a whole slew of arguments, which are about the reasons why we should believe in equality is because as humans, we share certain crucial characteristics, might be dignity, might be rationality, might be particular kinds of cognitive abilities that differentiate us from non-human animals. Uh, might be a sense of justice, um, and that these are the qualities which, as human beings, we share and which, therefore, we should regard all human beings as our equals. It seems to me that this is a kind of line of argument that is just reproducing in a kind of, in a more, um, in, a, in a nicer way, <laughs> Uh, is reproducing the kind of the, the old historical arguments because it's making our claim to be regarded as an equal depend on something, some characteristic that we supposedly share with other human beings. And it, that's making it conditional. I mean, it's making it conditional on having and indeed being able to demonstrate that you have this characteristic so that it's not... Just the mere fact of being Homo sapiens, being a member of the, you know, the human species, is not enough in these arguments. There's got to be this other thing, this, you know, more substantial, you know, kind of, you know, more morally weighty, weighty kind of characteristic of humans that is the reason why I should regard you as my equal. And we know from history, and indeed we know from the societies we live in, that if you make the notion of equality conditional, <laughs> it becomes a test that lots of people are deemed to have failed. And, and one of the, I think one of the kind of the, the more common sense ways, apart from the philosophical literature in which you see that, is the, the moralizing of the notion of the human. So uh, if you take examples like uh, the fact that um, uh, in the UK, uh, if, you're, if you're a prisoner, imprisoned for what might not be a kind of hugely heinous crime, you're not allowed to vote, right? In America, as we know, um, you can be deprived of the vote, not just depending on which state you live in, deprived of the vote, not just during your imprisonment, 
but actually for the rest of your life, right? So what's going on there is that people are saying, your equality, your, your status as an equal citizen, it doesn't depend on you just being a member of Homo sapiens. Uh, it doesn't even just depend on you having certain cognitive capacities or a sense of justice. It depends on you being a good human being, right? And if you're a bad human being, we can take away all of these things. And we see this in, you know, uh, the ways that people think about criminals, the way that they think about terrorists, the ways they think about paedophiles. There's a, there's a huge conditionality in people's willingness to think of other human beings as indeed their equals. So I think the philosophers are going down a very dangerous road in their search for the, what is it about us humans? that justifies regarding one another as equals. I just think that's absolutely the wrong question to ask. And that, that we, should, we should recognize that equality, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not about, you know, it's, it's something which is, it's a political commitment that we make. And it's a claim that we make, you know, where if you're, in, if you're not treated as unequal, you resist that, you say, no, I am as good as you are. You make a claim to equality and you don't have to go around proving my brain's as big as yours or, or my sense of dignity is as important. You don't have to prove these things. You shouldn't have to prove these things. Uh, you shouldn't have to demonstrate that you share the basic human qualities. All you have to be is a human being. So there's a way in which, um, the kind of the focus on, I mean, of course, there are all kinds of human characteristics, you know, humans, and, and they're incredibly varied. And some of them are very bad, and some of them are very good. Um, and as I say, I think one of the human characteristics is, is, remains an aspiration towards equality, but there are lots of human characteristics, which are much less attractive than that. So it's not that I think that there aren't characteristics of human beings, but I think the idea, either that both that you claim that there are certain characteristics that all humans share, might or might not be empirically the case, but also that you make those shared characteristics, the justification for treating others as equals, you're actually providing a justification for inequality. Um, so, so I think, yeah, so as I say, it's not that we don't have human characteristics, but that making those the grounds for thinking of others as human is, to my mind, um, is, is reproducing uh, all of the traps that the kind of earlier um, uh, philosophers fell into when they talked so gaily about all men being born equal and just never thought for a moment, why is this just men? Why not women as well? Or all the other exclusions that they simply overlooked. Mm. Okay, so if we buy your argument that, well, look, if you start well, of course, you should buy my argument. Yes, well, okay. When you buy your argument, <laughs> yeah. when you buy your argument, after you bought your argument, um, so you might say, okay, so um, I, I, I accept uh, what Anne is saying there that if you start purchasing a, a conception of human nature, it could be at the cost of universality. So. Yes, yeah. But I, I still need to get more detail from Anne about because she may purchase universality, but what is this? claim. I want to know more about that. It's, it sounds too fuzzy still. Mm -hmm. um, so can you, can you kind of flesh out what you mean by the claim of equality? You said there initially, well, I'm equal and I know and I'm treated unequally. So maybe if you could spell that out, because if you want to make that programmatic, at least you mm -hmm. could say mm -hmm. more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think what's implied in your question is that there's a lot more in the end, there is a lot more about what what does it actually mean to claim to be an equal? Yes. Um, for example, uh, in claiming to be an equal, um, are you saying um, you have an equal right to the same share of resources as everyone else? Or uh, are you saying yeah, not just that I'm as good as you in the kind of general sense of I'm, I'm a human being like you are with a life, a human life to live, but I'm as good as you at doing everything that you do, which, you know, is almost certainly empirically incorrect because people are good at different sorts of things. So, there's a, yeah, you're right. There's obviously there's a lot of fleshing out to that. And for me, the most important fleshing out is to what extent does the claim 
to be equal, to be of this, you know, not to be of lesser significance than you, not to be of lesser status than you, not to be less important than you in the sense that we are both human beings, uh, that what does that claim mean, if anything, in terms of how we therefore might need to organize society? Mm -hmm. And in particular, what kind of implications does it have in terms of uh, material inequalities? I, um, I mean, I very much think that there's an emptiness in um, saying that people are of uh, equal status and yet thinking that's consistent with the kind of scale of material inequalities that uh, we see in societies around us at the moment. Um, and, and also, I think, though this is a kind of an empirical claim and, you know, I can't kind of prove it, but it seems to me that it actually, it seems pretty evident looking around you, that if you live in a society which is characterized by, in, you know, intense material inequalities, um, people lose the capacity, if they ever had it, to think of others as their equals. I mean, the rich do not think of the poor as their equals. I mean, you know, they, on the whole, they they feel, you know, distaste and contempt, if anything. Um, that's not a kind of, <laughs> that, that's that's not a kind of notion, notion of equality. So there are all kinds of further questions. You're quite right. I mean, I don't think it's that it's fuzzy, but I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's saying there's a kind of, there's a commitment to seeing others as equals. There's a refusal of being seen as lesser than others. So a claim to equality. But the actual question then of what does that mean about what kind of society should we be living in? Um, that's not something that, that, that I have answered or would be able to answer, except that it is very clear to me that it can't be consistent with the level of material inequalities that we have at the moment, which just, which, which just undermine the kind of the possibility to actually view others as equals. Hmm. That, yeah, because, I mean, now, I may be reading too much in, but what seems to me very powerful about your work is almost what's, what's most implicit about it. I'm thinking, of, thinking here about unconditional yes. equals, and also about the human, I think it comes out. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how I, how I see your, your work, your late work. Well, if you take the claim of equality seriously, and you're saying we, we need to take that seriously, Yes. Then I can be, I can be almost agnostic on a principle level about what that would mean, because what it means and how it gets implemented, all that needs to happen will happen correctly if we take that claim seriously. And I don't need to uh, tell you what justice is or what equality is beyond that, because that's an open-ended question that will emerge in a free and equal way if we take the claim of equality seriously. That's how I read implicitly the power of this statement. So when I said it's fuzzy, maybe it's it's deliberately fuzzy or deliberately vague. It's it's vague from a principle point of view. I can't prescribe what, a, what justice is because we don't know what justice is until we everyone takes the claim of equality seriously. And when that happens, then we'll see what emerges. But what, for that to happen, we can't have huge inequalities because then we're not taking the claim of equality seriously. So now, maybe you correct me if, I, if I've got that wrong. So we, the next chapter of your work was, how would that happen? <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think that that is, that is partially a read. I mean, I think that there are probably two things going on. One is incapacity, right? That I, 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 I don't have the kind of, the knowledge, the skills, the capacities, some of which require knowledge of economics, for example, to, I mean, or better knowledge than I have, to spell out what are the kinds of conditions that we would need to live in in order for this conception of equality to flourish and to sustain itself and to reproduce itself. So part, part of not doing it is just not doing it. <laughs> Uh, but I think you are right that there, there is, you know, that an important implication of the notion that, you know, 
of, of seeing every human being as of equal significance and status is that it means you can't go around, you know, either presuming that you know um, how people ought to be organizing and living their lives or that you can, you know, write a treatise which sets that out. But I, I mean, if I felt that I could write that treatise, maybe I would. <laughs> so I'm not sure it's, it's somewhere it's between those two, but you are right. There is, there is importantly an element of that. And one of the things that I, one of the arguments that I come to towards the end of uh, unconditional equals is the argument that in a way we should be, um, we shouldn't be trying to um, uh, define or uh, definitively um, establish what is equality. Um, and and I, I focus, you know, that we should be working from the idea of challenging inequality, challenging oppression, challenging uh, subordination. Obviously, in identifying anything as unequal or oppressive or subordinating, you have an implicit idea of what a system of equality would look like. But you don't need to, and you almost certainly don't have it fully worked out. And I, I, I mean, I, I, I have thought about this particularly in relation to questions of gender equality. So I actually have quite a, um, I have, I have for myself quite a worked out idea of what a world of gender equality would look like, and it would be a world in which none of the things that we do um, were in any way determined by whether we were male or female. So the jobs we do, the roles we play in relation to childcare. Um, the kind of the the ways the ways we think the ways we talk, you you just wouldn't you wouldn't be able to predict what somebody would do from whether or not they were male or female. So that in a way the gender divisions of labour would just disappear. Right, mm -hmm. that's kind of my part of my image of what a, a really gender equal future would look like. It would be like a kind of abolition of of gender as a significant marker in organising our lives. Um, but that's not what a lot of feminists would would argue for. There are a lot of feminists who would say, well, I don't have any problem with there being uh, with men and women doing different sorts of things within society. As long as we are all recognized as equals, we all have the kind of the same um, equal access to resources. The fact that there might be, you know, that, that women might be more involved in caring for children and men more involved in something else, that doesn't bother me. Uh, so there are lots of feminists who would say that. And I kind of think, well, actually, we probably agree on what's unequal. We agree on what's oppressive. We agree on what's subordination. Those are the things we should start from. We don't have to arrive. So we don't have to start from some agreement about what equality looks like. Um, We've got plenty to work on from what inequality looks like, which, of course, as I say, has an implicit notion of equality, but it may not and almost certainly isn't yet a fully worked out one. So, so, so yeah, so um, an openness. There's an openness. I'd rather say openness than fuzziness. <laughs> yes, OK. Uh, I, I completely accept that. Uh, yeah, fuzzy has a certain negative connotation. I, I didn't. Yeah, 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 I, no, I don't no. necessarily see it. I was thinking about fuzzy logic, but anyway. Uh, right, the, yeah. I mean, just what you were saying there is very interesting because I'm, as you were saying that, I was thinking of Judith Schlar. Yes, uh, yes. He thinks we get a better purchase on injustice, yes. On injustice than, yeah. like, so yes. let's try and make sure we don't have cruelty yeah. rather than yeah. going yeah. for justice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we, we, we have a much better grip on what cruelty looks like than what justice may be. There's yeah. much more contestation yeah. about the latter. I think that's right. She's been one of the kind of the, uh, I mean, her work is is now very often cited by people who are grappling with this today and thinking about how that, how we, sh we shouldn't be focused on equality, but inequality or shouldn't be, yeah. Yeah, she, she's a very important figure in that, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, you still have the problem. Well, one person's cruelty is another person's, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. So you, you don't get out of that, but I think you get a better purchase on yeah. the problem. Yeah, you don't get out of it, and you'll never get out of it just through the philosophy. No. I mean, you won't solve that through a more carefully delineated philosophy, because it's a political problem that people disagree about it. Yes. Um, 
before we go into the last section, I, I do want to ask your views on culture because this ah, is yes, something yeah. touched on. Because we've actually nicely touched on the other areas that in a kind of a more natural way. But I do want to ask you about culture. Uh, so let me ask it again in a sceptical way. A lot of people think that culture, thankfully, is separate from politics. I can enjoy culture without the about politics. You don't think that. Uh, so maybe if you can tell us why culture is so central to politics and vice versa. Yeah. Well, well, it, it relates to what what you what you attach to the idea of being an equal citizen. So um, uh, many, probably most parts of the world now um, are in some way multicultural. Um, that people, um, there's been a huge amount of movement across the globe, that people have different cultural backgrounds, they have uh, different religions. Uh, in, in the case of Canada, where a lot of the work on multiculturalism um, has, has been most prominent, uh, there's the kind of the, the t tension between French and English speaking Canadians, but also how to think about the relationship between the settler uh, communities in Canada and the indigenous First Nations who were you know, pushed out of much of their land and so on. In some way, if you're going to think about equal citizenship, you have to think about what does it mean to be equal that isn't just requiring all the more kind of minority groups to conform to whatever are uh, the values and the beliefs of the majority. That doesn't sound like equality. That sounds like, you know, you can you can become, it's it's another conditional kind of <laughs> equalizing. You can become equal to me as long as you become just like me. So you have to address in some way the questions of how to think about equal citizenship in a context where there is uh, quite considerable cultural diversity, how not just to impose one uh, set of, um, practices and beliefs on, on others. The problem, of course, for feminism <laughs> is that a lot of the ways in which multiculturalism then comes to be thought or comes to be practiced becomes a kind of negotiation with people taken to be the uh, spokesmen <laughs> of the cultural communities who say, well, we have this very cherished tradition, so we need to have some accommodation which allows us to continue with this very cherished tradition. And Quite often it turns out that this very cherished tradition is one which is highly patriarchal, uh, not supported by many of the women in the community, but they're not the ones who are being consulted. So you have you had a very big debate um, and still within, within um, feminism, uh, sort of uh, highlighted by Susan Morokin's uh, article called Is Multiculturalism Bad for Women? Which is sort of setting up this problem of particular versions of multiculturalism um, actually seem to agree to accommodations that simply reproduce inequalities uh, between women and men. On the other hand, as many feminists also argued, if you don't kind of engage with multiculturalism in some way, what you're doing is reproducing the dominance of the uh, of the you're, you're reproducing you're you're treating feminism as the voice of the majority uh, community um, and not engaging with what women in minority communities uh, argue. So the the way I I have tried to think about this is I mean I wrote a book called perhaps paradoxically multiculturalism without culture because mm -hmm. I wanted to challenge the very um, fixed notion of culture in which uh, it's thought that, that, that people have a kind of cultural identity or a cultural community, which is characterized by certain traditions or practices or beliefs, uh, which are somehow fixed, which are somehow developed in isolation from interchanges with all kinds of other traditions and practices, um, and which, which are not internally contested. Um, and argued that we should just get away from the idea that there is this um, this thing called culture. Um, so what, what basically I wanted to find a way in which I can defend the versions of multiculturalism that seem to be an implication of equal citizenship while making it clear that that doesn't mean 
giving up on defending the rights and equalities of women wherever they are. But, and this returns to some of the things that we were just saying, you know, it's in a way they have their voice. It's not my voice to tell them, you know, how ways in which they should contest what goes on in any particular community. And I think one element in my thinking about this goes back to uh, to my own family. I mean, I said that, um, well, I, both my parents were religious in their different ways, my father Protestant, my mother Catholic. Uh, my mother, really a pretty devout Catholic. Um, I'm, I'm not myself religious, um, uh, but I've very much disliked the kind of militant atheism of the kind that you see, say, in Richard Dawkins, mm. um, that treats believers, you know, almost as if they're idiots. You know, I think, I mean, many of the beliefs and practices of many of the religions are and have been profoundly patriarchal. Uh, but, you know, there are reasons why people are religious. And, you know, you can't treat half the world as fools. You know, you have to take people seriously. That's part of what equality means. So basically, you know, my I, I think the questions about culture is you can't you can't keep it out of politics, just as you can't keep religion out of politics. Um you have to find a way in which you can uh, create the institutions of equal citizenship um, that you know that provide people with their kind of protections, their rights, their equalities. But don't just assume that everyone has to become the same. Um, I mean, again, you have to you have to you have to get away from these conditions that you attach. I mean, I'm not saying there are no conditions that you attach to equality. I mean, there are certain kinds of uh, conditions to um, a democracy that, you know, that, that uh, are kind of important preconditions. But, but, but again, you know, wherever you see this kind of conditionality built in, you can be my equal if you have yeah. these characteristics or if you behave like this or if you dress like this, uh, I think it alerts you to uh, a problem in our practices of equality. Okay, yes, I mean... I mean, that book, like a lot of your other books, and actually it's been a kind of a theme now, but is this kind of, what emerges from your books is our tensions. Yes, yeah. Potentially yeah. unresolvable, but the yes. important thing is that we hold the tensions at the same time. Yes. And we don't lose, um, the act, there's a healthiness in that. Yes. Because we, we yes. know we have to, it's almost like negative capability that yes. Keith talked about. This ability to keep two contradictory, yes. Yes. but valid, yes. Yes, I love principles. some of the quotes that the, you can find around that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that, that seems to me, it comes out very, impresses my, itself on, on, on the reader when they read your books. Um, two, a couple of last questions. Um, and first one is, you know, when you look at the state of democracy in your own country and in the US at the moment, uh, two places where, up to quite recently, we thought were the wrongly or rightly, where where where, where democracy was safe, or at least liberal democracy. Um, what's your view of that, and you know, where do you think that's going? <laughs> right. Well, um, yes. Both both uh, uh, America and the UK has. Um, has had some very troubling political leaders, <laughs> um, and potentially so in the case of the US. Um, I think actually one of the things I would say about this is that the kind of the uh, the sense that many of us have that of kind of democracy in crisis, UK and US, but kind of you know many parts of the world, many parts of uh, of Central Europe, um, lots of sort of challenges to what you had thought of as basic principles of democracy, like the independent judiciary, the restrained executive, um, the freedoms of association being very much, you know, challenged in Britain at the moment. Um, I, I think one of the things I take from that is that uh, so much of, of my thinking about democracy and, uh, and, and so much of uh, democratic theorizing until relatively recently has been about precisely taking certain principles of democracy for granted and thinking about what more can we do? You know, how can we strengthen this? How can we make this democracy more substantial, more real? And in a way at the moment, we're being pushed back into the thing, the parts of 
parts of democracy that we'd more or less taken for granted, uh, these two are now um, being questioned and are under threat. So, um, I mean, I don't have any kind of very worked out thoughts about that, but that's clearly, a, it's, a, it's, a new, uh, it's a new moment in thinking about democracy. And it's not one, I think, in which people will or should stop thinking about all the issues about how to make democracy more substantial. But it clearly is one in which, um, however one does that, one has to recognize that you can't take those rather more basic um, aspects of democracy for granted, and that that has to be incorporated into whatever one is arguing for in terms of uh, further developments. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a very very challenging time, and a mm -hmm. and challenging particularly because, well, theoretically challenging because it requires us to think about the things we've taken for granted. I mean, it's politically challenging for all kinds of other reasons. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think there is a risk, which you know, things as you say we took for granted. Now we need, it looks like we need to be restated. Yeah. And yeah. Like for yeah. example, really basic like the rule of law. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, you know, if you lose the election, you you, you accept yeah, the defeat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they are so basic and yet have, have now become precarious. Yeah. Um, and the, the worry is that if we have to go back and re-justify them in a yeah. way that people grasp the importance of these things, if you lose that, you you kind of you're you're in a very yeah, bad place. Yeah. yeah. Then you can the, the the other things that we wanted to work on because we thought they were. They were they were safe and steady. Really? Yes, yeah. Take a take a back seat. So it's always we have to go back to go forward again. Yeah, I, I mean I suspect there are ways of doing both together rather than just a sort of swinging backwards and forwards. But uh, but yes, I mean it's it's definitely a it's definitely a challenge. Okay, um, I'd like to um, kind of uh, end these with asking people, uh, you know, if they're on a desert island. <laughs> If they had a piece of music, um, a book, or a luxury, uh, you, you you know that program BBC. What would, what would they take with them? So you can only have one book, one piece of music. Yeah, well, that's a bit mean, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I mean, it is. You know, I uh, as I said, I'm a kind of obsessive reader. I want a suitcase, um, and the the problem with a book is it's got to be a long book, but it's got to be a book I've already read. Otherwise, I might start it and discover I don't really like it. You know. And all the books I've already read, I've reread. The ones I like, I've reread so many times. So, so I want the suitcase. But if I can't have the suitcase, then probably something like Middlemarch, George Eliot's Middlemarch. But really, I want the suitcase, and I want lots of uh, lots lots of new novels as well as old ones. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, the um, the piece of music. Um. Again, it should be a long one. Um, there's no point having a four minute one. Um, I it, uh, it sounds rather gloomy, but I think I would have Mozart's Requiem, might be appropriate for a okay. being stranded on a desert island, but it's rather wonderful music. But, um, yes, yeah, and the luxury, uh, the luxury, I would have a set of gardening tools. I mean, even on a desert island, it must be possible to grow something, so that's what uh, that would keep me going for a while. If, is is your garden? Uh, you've got green fingers, have you? Is it a is it a paradise out your window there? Uh, at the at the moment, it's entirely rain soaked and hard to do anything. But it will be a paradise quite soon. <laughs> very good. Um, well, thanks very much, Anne. Um, well, thank it's been, you. It's been thank great talking much. to you about your work, and um, I'm really looking forward to reading your next book, whatever it's on. Right. Well, thank you very much. It's been uh, it's yeah, it's been really stimulating, and uh, I've I've enjoyed our couple of hours. <laughs>